It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 328 of Science on Top, recorded on Monday the 25th of March 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And before we get started, just a reminder to everyone, go to scienceontop.com slash donate to help us make the show. Your contribution to each episode is what helps us pay the bills, keep the lights on, and keeps us just the right amount of buzzed on coffee and alcohol. <laughs> now, let's begin looking at the freezing cold waters in Antarctica. And we've talked before about the subglacial lakes there that, are, despite being insanely cold, still have life in them. Well, a bit of a mystery may have been solved now. Why are those fish able to survive happily down there at temperatures that would turn other fish into a microwave meal, Penny? This is really cool. Um, the fish have essentially evolved an antifreeze in their blood. But this story isn't just about the evolution of the, well, not just about the antifreeze, but it's a 22-year-old mystery. Um, so there's two biologists, um, Chi Hing, Chris, Christina Cheng, and Arthur DeVries, both working on these real cold water fish. And in 1997, they were able to describe um, a gene in, found in the fish, the notothens, um, the Antarctic fish, that essentially makes antifreeze. And I quite like the name for it because the antifreeze formula is made of three different um, building blocks over and over and over again. So um, three or nine and then two alanines, which gets the name Thralala. So, um, <laughs> Sorry, what was the name? Thralala. So if you, I guess if you abbreviate three or nine, like th, and then alanine, alal, and then add a little a on the end, you get thralala. <laughs> so when I talk about thralala, I'm um, meaning this, this essentially this this antifreeze. It's it's essentially it's a protein um, that just has these three amino acids repeated over and over and over again. Thralala, thralala, thralala. And what it does is it means it sticks to ice crystals. <laughs> which it makes a barrier so that the little crystals can't join up and they can't grow. So antifreeze, essentially, ice just can't form when there's a lot of this protein around. And what Cheng and DeVries found in 1997 is that this antifreeze or, um, protein actually arose from an ancestral gene that made a digestive enzyme. It just so happens that there was a bit in the middle of the gene that had the right code for making the thralala units and you know that duplicated again and again the good old evolutionary story of random stuff happens random mutations random duplications but if you get an advantage like for example if you're a fish trying to live in subarctic waters you know then yay that's probably going to get passed on so this happened with this digestive enzyme the thralala gene or the thralala unit protein, you know, spread in the population, notothens could survive in Antarctica. Really cool. But what they also found was that on the other side of the world, there's a fish called the Arctic cod. So, you know, now we're talking North Pole, not South Pole. They also make antifreeze proteins and they also make them from thralala. However, what's really interesting is it didn't come from a digestive enzyme. It wasn't from that same enzyme. It's an example of convergent evolution when two different, two, two of the same thing evolves separately. We love differently. that. Mm. I love that. We always love those. Yeah. I love those things. It's um, surprisingly common, it seems. We keep hearing, you know, eyes that have evolved in three different uh, places at the same time or gecko I feet guess it's, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, like it's, you know, being a streamlined shape to swim through the water. Mm -hmm. Very useful, very successful. Mm -hmm. You're going to pass that gene on. You know, evolving an eye, sensing light, great. That's happening. You know, if you get that ability, that is just great. So you will pass, that will be passed on. And I guess the same as evolving antifreeze if you want to live, if you're living in a really cold environment. Mm -hmm. So 22 years on, 
Cheng has solved the mystery. And it turns out that looking in a digestive enzyme, in fact, looking in any kind of enzyme was just not going to work out. What they found is that by looking at the antifreeze genes um, and comparing them to species of cod that don't make antifreeze, they found a hint in, the, in a bit of junk DNA. So within our DNA, some of it codes for genes and the amount varies from species to species. So I couldn't really say for sure for cod, but a whole lot of it is essentially just junk, like meaningless sequences of bases that don't code for anything. Now, it's possible that, you know, in 50, 100 years, someone will listen to this podcast and just laugh and go, <laughs> oh, ho, 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 oh, the ignorance of the early 21st century when they talked about junk DNA when really it's just, the most I, important. I really love your optimism there, Penny. I'm oh, thinking, well, like two, two or three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I like the optimism that someone's going to be listening to this podcast. In- <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, there's a PhD for someone in the, in the late 2060s in here. Just mark my words. <laughs> Um, anyway, so this essentially it looks like this this bit of junk DNA that just happened to have the um, you know the right kind of segment for thralala was duplicated, then reduplicated. Then there was a chance mutation that turned it into exactly the right code, but then this snippet duplicated again and again and again. So it's you've then got that copy of enough you know, code for thrallalas to make antifreeze. But the thing about genes is it's not just enough to have information about the right sequence of things to put together, because essentially our DNA is just instructions on how to make proteins. You also need a little bit of, of tags. So to say, this is the start of a gene. This is when to do the gene and so on. So that happened, one mutation, and it was just the loss of a single letter let that kind of label happen, um, develop in the code in just the right spot. So the odds of all of these things just seem astronomical until you think about the millions of years and millions of pod and then you're like, yeah, and if it happened once, it was going to be really beneficial for that cod. In fact, even a kind of interim step where maybe it can weekly produce you know small amounts of antifreeze is probably going to be beneficial so i thought this was really cool it's a new gene it's arriving from scratch from a non-coding sequence you know sense from nonsense and it's this gene i guess is not easy to spot but you know because it took 22 years <laughs> but something that made it spottable is because it was quite simple it was quite a repetitive sequence and so on but you know there's much more com- complicated proteins out there and many of them may have arisen from what seems to be junk or sort of you know non-coding dna so i thought this was really cool um the same interesting gene making antifreeze but with two completely different evolutionary origins in DVA, in dna yeah i i think that's particularly incredible almost the not just the fact that you know they both evolved a method of coping with the environment but yeah, the exact same, the same protein is the exact same one yeah yeah oh, awesome um and just any story about Convergent evolution is going to get my interest. Uh, Okay, let's now move on. And I want to talk about superheroes. And if you go down the list of superpowers, you get your flight and strength, maybe invisibility or mind reading is in there. But I'd say for most people, having a super sense of smell wouldn't be too high up on the list. And there are some super smellers, as they're known, in the world who can detect odours too subtle for most people. Why is this a superpower, you ask? Well, it could help you diagnose Parkinson's before other symptoms are showing. Lucas, talk to me about this. How is this happening? I really like this one. We've talked before on another episode, and I can't remember which episode it was, so maybe a listener who, who has just happened to have recently listened to it can let us know. But there was an episode where we talked about how I, I've always been able to smell 
a cold on someone's breath. And I just thought everyone could do that. And I think it was when I brought this up on this podcast <laughs> and all of you went, wait, what? Huh? <laughs> that I've gone, is this not common? Is this not something that everyone can do? I remember doing this like in primary school. It's like, oh, stay away from that kid. They've got a cold. And, and what I became aware of later on was that I'll ask people if they've got a cold and they'll say, and sometimes they'll say no, but then they can have a cold a day or so later. So, I mean, this is not data. This is I was going to say, right? you need to Get write that. this down and keep track. <laughs> need to keep track, need to do a proper study, blah, blah, blah. Haven't done that, don't care about it enough. But it's something that I anecdotally am aware of that I, that's just something I can smell on people's breath as far as I, I believe. Now, this this was quite interesting, this story, and it really jumped out at me for a number of reasons. One, the super smeller thing and, and, and identifying things um, using smell. So there have been um, – uh, I know there's been canines used in the past um, mm-hmm. to, uh, to, to locate or, um, you know, be, basically to pinpoint people in, in um, retirement homes, for example – um, who who are developing certain cancers that give off certain odors, so it's not unprecedented for this sort of thing. But we're talking here about Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is is pretty prevalent. It, it affects about a one percent of the population at age sixty, about four percent of the population by age eighty. It's one of those things that it's going to be cancer, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's are probably things you're going to you know, you, you're going to face if you if you do live to those advanced ages. So, it's relatively prevalent in the in the population. Now, but there's no cure for Parkinson's. We we really can't do much about it at all. Um, the there are various treatments that you can you can reduce your symptoms, but a diagnosis of Parkinson's, which usually comes along only once you are symptomatic, is something that pretty much is just the you know uh, the first knowledge you will have of a long downhill slide that you, you're facing. So it's, it's not great. Now, one of the reasons we tend not to diagnose it until it's actually quite advanced is because the, the degeneration, the neurodegeneration that occurs, uh, there's quite a lot that happens before you typically become symptomatic. So it's usually the symptoms that cue people on and they go and get tests and so on and so forth. Um, and on that, there isn't a simple test. You don't just go and you know go to your local pathology and get the Parkinson's test. There ain't one. Um, basically, it involves a whole lot of brain imaging and specialists, and and um, they're looking for certain brain cells that produce dopamine uh, that have been you know damaged or destroyed. So there's a lot going on, right? So um, it's it's quite a difficult thing to to even confirm. So fast forward to a conference that was taking place over in the UK. Um, a, a particular scientist was was giving a uh, presentation on Parkinson's research, and there was someone in the audience who asked towards the end of the presentation, you know, along the lines of, "But what are you doing, you know, about the way that people with Parkinson's smell? Like, why aren't you doing something about that as as a way of of you know of helping them?" And initially, the, the, the scientist, Baran, basically, okay, whatever. That's an anecdote. Thanks very much. Thanks hmm. for sharing. And next question. It's, it's a rather um, <laughs> rude thing to say. Like, <laughs> Well, I mean, and that, they actually considered that, right? So, so it, was, it was actually after, after this, a little while later, when uh, the, the, um, the lead author of this paper was, was chatting with a, another um, a colleague who's a professor of mass spectrometry at the uh, spectrometry at the University of Manchester, and they were talking over. What do you reckon this woman was talking about? Do you think that she was talking about the fact that Parkinson's patients lose their sense of smell, or was she saying that there's something unique about Parkinson's patients' personal hygiene, or something? like what? What was she talking about? And actually, it wasn't until a, yet another colleague um, heard about this, and this colleague had a good sense of smell. And she actually said to them, "You should probably have a chat to her because she may be she may be detecting something that we're not aware of." So, okay, it's one of those you know chains of events mm. that you see in documentaries where you go, "Man, I often will will look at a discovery and think, how the hell 
did they come up with that? Who was the first person who thought, I'm going to try and do this thing in this thing yeah. and see what happens? Like, why would you do that? Well, this is one of those things. It's like, you know, there was a, a, a few conversations. Someone said something in a, in a presentation, and then uh, that was pondered by a couple of people who then spoke about it with, with more people, and they went, actually, maybe we should look into this a little bit more. Yeah. So they tracked her down. Her name was Joy Milne. She was a retired nurse living in a town near Edinburgh, and she was a retired nurse. And it turned out that she had uh, told them stories that, you know, she she used to be able to smell this on patients uh, who she knew to have Parkinson's. She also had mentioned that decades earlier, her husband, um, who had died of Parkinson's, um, she had noticed a sudden strange odour coming from, from him long before he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, which stayed with him from that point. So... So basically, as far as she's concerned, just like me with smelling cold, she just, as far as she was concerned, she can smell Parkinson's. That's just a thing that people do. Um, not a thing that people know about, apparently, because um, they looked into this a little bit further and they thought, well, let's actually do some tests here. Rather than just relying on the anecdote, which is useless to us, let's actually do some tests. So they contrived some tests where they basically, yeah, if you heard of the T-shirt test, we've talked about that on the show before as well. It's been used for a few other things. But basically, the T-shirt test, you get people to sleep in T-shirts. You get some Parkinson's patients. You get a control group of people who haven't got Parkinson's. You get them to sleep in identical T-shirts, and then you present them to the, the super smeller, and the super smeller smells them and goes, okay, this one has Parkinson's. This one has not got Parkinson's. So not only did she correctly identify all of the T-shirts that belong to the Parkinson's patients, she could apparently rank them based on the strength of the odour and matched T-shirts that have been worn by the same person multiple times. Like, you know, different different T-shirts, but the same person had worn, you know, T-shirt A and T-shirt F, for example. So clearly, her sense of smell is pretty good. So she had one false positive, though. She flagged one of these T-shirts from the control group as someone who had Parkinson's. So I thought, oh, well, that's a shame, you know, so it's not infallible. Yeah. Turns out, that person had undiagnosed Parkinson's. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> the person in the control group. So, um, so yeah, they've thought, okay, clearly we've got something we need to look into a little bit here. So they first started looking at sweat. They thought maybe there was something that was – that was um, in the in the person's sweat that was that was uh, being detected by by Milne. Um, so they they did various tests. Basically, they said they had students running up and down hills with gauze under their armpits. So I'm assuming she then had to smell the the gauze without. Mm -hmm. Not it's not you know it doesn't sound very it's not great. But anyway, so <laughs> she wasn't able to identify Parkinson's people from the sweat. So they were okay, well, it's not a sweat thing. So then they looked at the sebum. So you've got, you know, oil on your, on your face and sometimes behind your ears, you've got these glands that sort of secrete this, this sebum, which are, is like a, a sort of a, uh, an oil. Um, they, they basically narrowed it down to that. It was, it was something that was in, in, in this oil that's, that's on your, your skin. Um, that uh, she was able to uh, to identify. So they took samples of the people she was uh, to identify from um, and they ran them through fairly complex uh, processes using, and I wasn't aware that this was a thing, but it was gas chromo, well, there, yeah, I've already forgotten, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Yep. <laughs> yes, or CGMS for short. I can see why they've got it for short on that one. <laughs> Shame they haven't got something like Tralala or something. That would be <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this this episode clearly has to be called Tra -la 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 -la. <laughs> um, So they used that, and they basically they found there there was there was some unique um, compounds that were in these people's sebum oil, um, and and that was that effectively those compounds are what causes the smell of people with Parkinson's. So what next? The team are now currently working on training dogs to detect these scents and to, you know, call out, <laughs> yelp, bark, whatever they do, when when they find them. So, you know, that, again, that's been used before. I've been aware of this for cancer and a few other things. So, um, or some cancers, I should say. Cancer's not one disease, people. Um, so, uh, so that's interesting. They're also working on basically robotic sensor type things that could, that could smell this. So this, basically, someone standing up, at a conference saying, but what about the smell? I mean, surely someone's looked into that. It's yeah. such an obvious thing. 
Yeah. And I was like, no, what now? <laughs> what smell? What are we talking about? Now could lead to, um, it, it sounds like it's quite likely to lead to a way of detecting Parkinson's a heck of a lot earlier. Mm. If we get to that point, it means we might be detecting Parkinson's years before it otherwise would have been detected. And that opens up a whole lot of other possibilities as well. Mm, prevention. Potentially. I mean, it means that you, you have a much longer baseline to study people, for example. You pick them up much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. You've got a, a much longer baseline to study things, which could help lead to potentially other treatments or perhaps even a cure at some point. But I just, yeah, I love the story. I thought it was awesome. It is. It's great. Um, the other interesting thing was that they found that it was in the sebum. And it is a known factor with Parkinson's sufferers that they do produce more sebum uh, than healthy people. I did not know that. And Parkinson's sufferers often, as a result of that, have uh, severe dermatitis uh, because of their blocked sebum pores and stuff right. like that. So all there these little go. clues that might there you get go. away. I thought that was interesting. And if anyone's wondering, what mm. does Parkinson's smell like? It has a sort of woody, musky odour, apparently. So make of that what you will. <laughs> make of it what you will. Someone asked me on Twitter the other day when I tweeted about this story and mentioned that I long believed that I could smell colds. They said, what does a cold smell like? It's like, it actually doesn't smell like <laughs> anything else. There is nothing I could describe that this smells like. It's, it has its own smell. And, yeah, it, it, it's now maybe I should sort of – do something about this and, and start writing things down and see how much of it is just uh, Miss, yeah. you know a, a bias that's happening here, a confirmation bias of I forget all the ones I, I smell and diagnose and then never actually uh, find out whether they had a cold after all. Maybe they just had bad breath. Also true, yeah. And maybe you need to hang around more Parkinson's sufferers so you can learn that smell. And yeah. Maybe. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a woody, musky smell, apparently. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yep. All the trees have for. Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we were sort of talking about DNA earlier on, Penny. And as most people know, DNA is made up of nucle four nucleotides, each one containing a lettered base, so your G, A, T, and C. But now an interdisciplinary team of researchers has doubled that genetic code by creating synthetic DNA that uses eight letters. And Penny, this is expanded, this expanded alphabet, sorry, means there's way more combinations and ways that they can be arranged, which just opens the doors up, I guess, to almost endless possibilities of what we can do with that. Yeah, it's really, really cool because we've done a few sort of DNA-based stories before, like when we looked at the possible arsenic in DNA mm -hmm. but then it wasn't and all that kind of thing, which is looking at or, you know, finding other bases that might be used by living things. So this is not um, a biological story in that, I mean, it, obviously DNA is biological, but it's not something that we might find in the natural world. It's really creating synthetic DNA and then seeing what can be done with that. So... The way that the DNA bases work is that the bases themselves each match up to a pair. So C and G go together. And the reason they go together is that the chemical, the atoms that make up the bases have, um, they can do, make hydrogen bonds with each other. And there's, um, oh gosh, I, it's a while since I taught this. I'm just going to say, I think there's like three hydrogen bonds between C and G and two between A and T. And the way it fits together is that you just can't match an A with a C, you know, mm -hmm. or a T with a G. They have to go with their pair. So what this team has done is they've made some new pairs of bases, including one um, that's called S and B and another one that's called P and Z. And these synthetic bases pair up in the same way, like hydrogen bonds in between them. There's been other synthetic bases that have been made that pair up in different ways but for reasons that I'll talk about more they, they're not as successful as in making synthetic DNA. So what's special about these new synthetic bases is that they're predictable so they predictably and reliably make pairs with their partners. They don't change the structure of the DNA double helix which is really 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 important because other chemicals that you can put into DNA to make a new letter 
can actually change the structure of that DNA or they, they can't be put, um, you know, all in a row. You have to have some of the natural bases in between them. So these new synthetic bases can be put in a, in a row and the structure of DNA will still hold. And what's really important is that they can be transcribed into RNA. So DNA is like information storage. It's where all the genes that you'll ever need or that you've got are. But RNA is another nucleic acid. And it's essentially like the good old fashioned metaphor is if the DNA is like a filing cabinet, you know, a gene is like a piece of paper in that filing cabinet. And the RNA is like a copy of that gene. It's instructions that then can be taken out of the nucleus of the cell to go and, you know, make a protein or to do something else because RNA has some functions on its own. So this synthetic DNA um, has been shown it's able to actually, um, if you create some that codes for a particular kind of RNA molecule or RNA sequence, um, it can do it and that RNA sequence will function correctly. So this is really cool. It can do a lot already and it solved a lot of problems that have been made with previous DNA sequences. There's still more to do before we're like, yes, we've now added four extra letters, making it an eight letter code. Um, but so, for example, you know, can it be replicated and so on? Um, but this is really cool. Now, my first thought is, you know, this is like some episode <laughs> of Star Trek and, and you immediately expect to see some, you know, there are some things man was not meant to know kind of creation, which coincidentally looks like a rather like human with some green face <laughs> and, and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there are some really, really interesting applications mm -hmm. of DNA. I know that the idea of like DNA computing has been floated a number of times and I've got no idea where current research is standing on that. But because it is, you know, an information storage molecule, it's interesting to think about, you know, different ways that we could use it in computing power. I cannot well, not even on power, that. even just data yeah. storage. I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. we've had uh, an entire full mm. operating system has been stored in DNA. An entire movie has been mm. stored in DNA. So it uh, obviously you can think about how tiny it is and it lasts much yeah. longer than any other method mm. of storage that we have. So that's an impressive and exciting Thing. And obviously, as I said, you just have that many more possible combinations. So infinitely mm. more, almost infinitely more storage capability from that. Yeah, but on a more practical level, um, it's also been shown that strands of DNA that contained in two of these bases, Z and P, were actually better at binding to cancer cells, for example, oh. than sequences using the normal DNA. So there's all sorts of interesting applications. Like, I feel like... You know, an idea like this or an innovation like this, just when people really start working with it and using it and doing things, it's going to have all sorts of impacts and, and applications. It's, it's a really, really big, a big deal and really interesting. It's sort of like where we're at with DNA, I think, is where, you know, Marconi mm. was when he found about electricity and magnets and all that sort of stuff. Like, we have no idea what yeah. this is necessarily going to mean, but we know it could be mm. really, really we know impressive. It's... So, mm. exciting. Yeah. And, Lucas, I don't think we've talked very much about NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which is currently orbiting asteroid 101955 Bennu. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about it and what cool things has it revealed about the building blocks of our solar system? Sure. So we've talked about there's a couple of missions that are out at um, uh, out at uh, asteroids at the, at the moment that have got that are the return missions, their sample return missions. So one of them is out at Ryugu, um, and the other one is is out at Bennu, which is the uh, NASA mission Osiris Rex, which come on uh, we often talk <laughs> about the. So Osiris Rex, get this, this is Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer, which is the EX. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Really <laughs> reaching there for a way to make Osiris Rex. Reaching, yep. really reaching. But I, but I kind of, I respect <laughs> it. I respect it. I really do. Because the, the, the lengths 
to which they're they prepared to go to retrofit. Yeah. It certainly makes it easier to refer to the missions. Yeah. I've got to be honest with you. But anyway, so Osiris Rex, uh, it's a mission. Re- it's a. It's sorry. It's a sample return mission. So it's really cool. It's 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 meant to land on Bennu and and uh, uh, sort of puff some gas at the at the surface and collect into a, a, a canister the dust particles that that would be blown up from the surface of this this asteroid problem is this asteroid is not what we thought it was this asteroid is a rubble pile um it's it's not a a solid body at all um it it actually has really really low density which which uh um means that these these rocks haven't formed a solid object so much as they're just sort of stuck together with mutual gravity but not there's not enough gravity to sort of pull them into a a, a single you know body um in terms of density they're basically only slightly more dense than water so uh so water is is basically one gram per cubic centimeter um this is around 1.1 uh 1.19 grams per cubic centimeter so it's really low density. Um, that they're basically there's 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 a lot more empty space than rocks in in this thing. The other thing that complicates things is, as I mentioned, rocks. We didn't expect it to be, like we knew it was we we knew it was not a, like a an iron um, asteroid, you know, like an iron rich asteroid, which which tend to be a lot lot you know more compact and a lot denser. Um, we didn't know. I mean, this thing's way way out, right? So we didn't know. Um, that, you know, it was basically lots of rocks. We thought we'd have some nice clear spaces to sort of land and do our elaborate little puff the gas at the at the surface and collect the stuff. But, uh, yeah, they're not even sure they're going to be able to land Bennu on the uh, – sorry, Osiris Rex on Bennu because there's just freaking rocks everywhere, like everywhere. Um, and if you look at the photos of this thing, there's some gorgeous photos, some things that have been taken from quite close from the orbiter. Um it's like it, it. It seriously, it just looks like a pile of rubble from a from a building site. It's 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 it's, it's absurd. So that in a, in and of itself, okay, that's an issue, and the the mission team are dealing with that issue. But what they've just uh, just noticed is that not only is this pile of rubble, which is spinning, by mm-hmm. the way, as a lot of things are in space, it's spinning and it's got a really weird shape. It's sort of like a a, a diamond standing on a, a like that typical diamond shape standing on its side it also seems to be sort of spewing or spitting bits out into space oh and that's that's not normal that's that's abnormal that asteroids don't normally spit stuff yeah. into space asteroids yeah. normally do the thing that they do and and they they you know but especially if it's just a collection of rocks like what is there to right cause why is it spitting anything right so, so comets spit, right? But they don't. Well, they they outgas. So comets, when comets come closer to the the sun, they heat up, and that causes usually in craters and stuff. It causes outgassing. So you get um, you know sublimation of, of material going straight from from its its solid frozen state into into gas gash, <laughs> not gas gas. Something I was uh, Sean Connery, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, but but. That's that's not what's happening here. We don't we don't have ice. In fact, it's actually really low on in terms of how much water it has in it, which it itself is a bit of a an interesting thing actually, because its low water content um, is at odds with with certain um, uh, certain structures which are only formed when there's water, which which have been observed. So it. It, it's more evidence to the fact that this actually came from a much larger body at some point in time that was much higher in water, um, and and when this was was ejected from that, probably as lots of different rocks um, uh, that that happened to be shot out in one direction, it was probably some sort of collision or whatever that did it. So that that's interesting in in and of itself. But yeah, so really low uh, water density, which means that one possible explanation, which is that sunlight is hitting pockets of ice for example and causing them to turn to gas to sublimate that maybe would would give a bit of a kick to individual bits of rock that would fly off 
Now, these aren't big pieces of rock that are flying off, but they're big enough. They're not just dust-sized stuff. There's some, like, pebble-sized stuff that's coming off of it. And if you look in the, the photos, there's there's photos where you can compare multiple shots and you can see the, th- you know, Benno itself is rotating. I'm using my hands. My hands are up in the air in front of me, by the way. So just imagine my hands in my air. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the Benno, is, Benno is rotating. And as it rotates in these images, you can see, you can see Benno's rot- rotation as, uh, you know, in the foreground. In the background, you can see stars, which relative to each other are not moving. They are moving relative to the rotation because we're orbiting around a rotating thing. So we're we're rotating, it's rotating, the stars are not, right? So you can see the background of the stars are are appear to be moving compared to the the to Bennu, but they're not moving compared to each other, right? So you know they're stars, but then there's other things that are moving relative to both, which are these these pebbles and particles and things, um, and they're being flown off in all sort of different directions so it's almost like okay is there like some sort of you know whiz fizz party going on here is there (laughs) are there there things like what is causing this we don't actually know what it is um and that's awesome we love not knowing things then that's great but are we not concerned then that we have an expensive piece of equipment orbiting a thing that is unpredictably throwing rocks at it sure Hey, mission parameters change, and, and, <laughs> and this is now this is now another really cool thing that we didn't know um, mm. that we have an instrument there that's observing, which is kind of cool. I think I mean we're going to narrow it down on it, right? There's there's a whole lot of uh, theories as to why this could be uh, happening, hypotheses I should say as to why this could be happening. So it could just be that there there is some kind of um, a spin related settling of of these rocks. So. Bennu has a spin, and in fact, it's it, it's being spun up. It will get faster and faster and faster over time, and that's mainly caused by light pressure and uh, and temperature differential. So it is slowly getting faster. And over a few million years, it will actually get so fast that it will fly apart because yeah. the the centrifugal forces will be t- too great. They'll overcome. The, uh, the gravitational force that's holding it together right now, and this thing will eventually spin itself apart, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah. But we're nowhere near that point now, and there's not enough spin to be just throwing the rocks off at this point in time. So that ain't the cause mm-hmm. of it. But maybe the same thing that's spinning it up could be heating some rocks, which might be causing them to move around. The spin itself might be causing them to move around, and maybe... You know, if you've got a whole lot of little rocks and a whole lot of big rocks and a big rock, you know, puts pressure on a little rock, maybe that little rock's going to splinter. Maybe it's going to crack. Maybe it's going to break apart. And that action might be then throwing parts out, parts of the little rocks out into space, maybe. I mean, there's a whole lot of other theories, that, uh, hypotheses as to what could be causing it. But the thing is, at the moment, we don't know, which is uh, which is really cool. That is. And uh, uh, there's, more, there's more I could go on, but I think I've said enough. <laughs> I just think that now they don't even have to bother with descending and collecting samples. They can just wait and catch the samples. <laughs> yeah, <but>. true. <laughs> yeah, so the next next uh, NASA mission uh, to be approved by Congress be will be net. just a great big catches mitt, um, <laughs> and, and they're happy with that because it's within budget. So that's uh, yep. that'll be great. <laughs> oh, interesting to see uh, what becomes of all that. And I think that's uh, all we were going to talk about tonight. So. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 328. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Penny, Lucas, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Sid. Thanks, Sid. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. The home of really good cheese claims hip-hop music makes cheese taste best. Researchers in Switzerland, where they make Swiss cheese, exposed five 22-pound wheels of immensal cheese to different kinds of music played on a loop for six months and a half, no, six and a half months, 24 hours a day. Mm. And a group of food professionals participated in blind taste tests and declared that the cheese exposed to a tribe called Quest tastes best. So I want hip-hop cheese.
Lots Maybe have some Swiss cheese with de la soul next. Ah.